All right. Hey, everyone. My name is Sydney Lai, and I'm the host of Decoded. Decoded is a podcast series for the next generation of developers. And I'm so excited to be able to talk to Jesse Showwater today. He is a full stack designer based out of Austin, Texas. And thank you so much for joining the show. I am just so excited to learn more from you. And yeah, yeah thanks talk- for having me on the show. I'm really oh. excited too. Uh, yeah, I I am just so excited because I think, you know, oftentimes as developers, we talk to other developers of how we build, how we, you know, in our own world design. And as you can imagine, there's a lot of full stack developers, but I'd like to learn more about your perspective as being a full stack designer. What is what is that like and what was that journey towards reaching that that skill set, I should say? Sure. Yeah, I kind of like brought that term together because uh, I, you know, I started out my my career, traditional print design, brochures, packaging, all that kind of stuff, hated it, um, learned how to build websites really quickly, design them and then start like coding them. I mean, we're talking like late 90s, early 2000s, Dreamweaver tables. Ugh, it was awesome. And then um, and then I really just started to love uh, building websites in general. And that kind of parlayed itself into UI design, UX design, still front end development. Um, and as that as technology kind of grew, making sure that I kept that skill set going. So I started realizing like I have this stack of skill sets that range from branding and web design to UI and UX and kind of like strategy and critical thinking into like front end development and just the smallest bit of back end development enough to get me in trouble and break things. So I was like, "Mm, that's like a stack. Like I'm going to be a full stack designer and kind of live in this realm where I can do UI UX design a little bit of front end dev and kind of be helpful on both sides. That's, that's how I kind of like grew into this place that I'm at right now. And it's actually, it's opened up this wide array of uh, like pathways to like reach in and help people and consult um, and just kind of share expertise and experience. Gotcha. And so when you, when you started, when you started becoming this full stack designer and you're learning these skill sets, I think also was there a transitional period between also a full stack designer, also a content creator? Because when I first discovered you was actually watching as a, as a developer, I started watching your videos on building fast, becoming a designer who can also build prototypes and, and, and being able to launch those products. Right. And so when I started, you know, I, I saw you as a full stack designer, but you're also a YouTuber. You're also a content creator. Um, and, and I, I absolutely love your channel. So I, I yes. highly recommend this to other developers as well. And so like, w- also what is this merge between like a full stack designer also into a content creator? Are there overlaps? What are kind of some of the differences? Yeah, I think there's there's uh, application from one to another, and there's probably some similarities and some overlaps. So the applications from one to another is um, one of the best ways to learn something is to teach something, right? So um, preparing yourself to like share experience, knowledge, and also expertise means that you have to spend the time honing that. So I'm a teacher. I talk with my hands. I tell lots of stories just naturally. Like I'm, I, without meaning to kind of tend to always be teaching. So a lot of time I have a nine and a 10 year old. They're like, shut up, dad. Like, we don't need you to teach us right now. Just like love us and like play with us. I'm like, you got it. So I'm just naturally, (laughs) naturally tend to kind of teach. And I, the, the kind of like, um, the outpouring of that, of like, knowledge and skill set and design said, Hey, I feel like I could actually be helpful to other people. So that's how it kind of connected. I was like, maybe I just start teaching online. I'll start a YouTube channel. Um, and maybe, maybe somebody will be just like me, like 10, 12, 13 years ago, where I was reading like Photoshop blogs going like, what the heck, how do I do this? This is my version of doing that. Right. So that's one piece. And then there is some overlap where as you create content, it's almost for me, it's like a metrics based system where I put a piece of content out into the world that talks about design or code or whatever it is. I'm going to get feedback from users that tell me that made sense to me. That didn't make sense to me. And that helps me to go back to the start of my own personal product design cycle where I start thinking about what I'm doing. So for me, it's this, it's this basket full of like metrics and feedback and and understanding who my user is and how I can help them best. Um, There's a real selfish kind of like, I put content out there, I'm an influencer, I talk about me. 
I try to try to like kind of shift my channel or focus my channel around people. What do you need? What are you struggling with in the industry? How, how, how hard is it for you to get a job? What questions are stumbling you in interviews? Like, okay, let me, let me figure those out. Let me pull some of my experience and, and ask other people and then make a piece of content that might be helpful to you. So for me, that's how that kind of plays out. Yeah, I think that's really great user experience design if, if that's even the proper term to use it. And I think that when you are a full stack designer, you're not only just designing or, you know, saying creating graphics or colors, topography, you're also thinking of how can you expand this medium and this medium, maybe if you're teaching, it goes into video blogs, et cetera. And I think that when you're also a full stack designer at, you know, what you were alluding to earlier at some point, you also need to know some sort of front end languages too. What was that transitional period where you said, okay, all right, I have to learn some HTML, CSS, maybe even some JS. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, so I was working at a tour company and I was doing like the print design and really quickly realized like, oh, this is kind of like not for me. And they asked me to start designing websites. It's like, okay. So I got tasked with using Dreamweaver to visually build these websites I was designing and um, I had a guy who worked with me who was kind of like the senior designer that was there who taught me how to do it. And he taught me everything wrong, like absolutely everything wrong. Um, and I realized I love designing websites and building websites. And I was like, you know what? I need to stop depending on this tool and I need to learn the foundations myself. So I went off and just started like finding any resource I could, books. Um, you know, blogs, uh, there wasn't as many, but I think like right around that time, like Treehouse maybe started popping out with some stuff. I'm like, Ooh, Treehouse, this is cool. Like Code Academy hit. And I'm like, okay, I need to le learn serious foundations, like rock solids of HTML, CSS. And then it was like, okay, that's great. I can make it, I can make this website. And it was always a needs based. I'm a person who says, learn what you need when you need it. So in that first iteration, it was, I need to know HTML and CSS to put together websites that are not based on tables and won't break with one slight mouse move. I need things to cascade and work well. And there was only in the next like necessity was like, yeah, but we need our websites to be interactive. I was like, okay, I have to learn JavaScript now. And then I was like, great. And I stood in that stack. I kind of remained in that stack for a while until people are like, yeah, we need a little bit more. And there's frameworks coming out. There's other things you can learn like React or Vue. I'm like, okay, I have to start kind of digging into those. And it was, it's, always for me been learn what you need when you need it. So like, I don't need a package manager until I need it. I don't need some sort of front end like framework until I need it. And then I know how I learn best. Um, and I'm going to dig in and learn that way and challenge myself with projects and, and figure things out and just learn, like I said, just learn that little bit that I need at a time to implement and then start building on top of it. So um, for me, that transition it has been a constant transition because I feel like we're all in flux. We're all learning as human beings and growing. So I need to evolve not with culture, but with the needs of the people that I'm trying to serve. That's how I tend to think about that evolution. Right. And I think that as you have experienced this revolution or evolution, I should say, as you've experienced this evolution, it sounds like you had to pick up tools. You had to pick up skills. You had to learn essentially as you went, it wasn't like, all right, I'm a designer. I'm, I'm done learning to be like, this is it, right? The ship has sailed. Yeah. As you've gone through this transitional period of learning new stacks, learning new tools, what, what has like in your memory, what do you remember in terms of transitioning from toolings? Right. So you talked about Dreamweaver. Um, and I definitely remember that back in the day. I, you probably, do you remember GeoCities oh, back in the day? Lord. Oh, Lord. Oh, Geo. mama. Oh. It was brutal. It's so oh. nice. And then, oh man, I listened, I'd have to find the reference for you, but listen to amazing, I think it was a 99% Invisible uh, okay. podcast episode all about the destruction of GeoCities and oh. how people went out and tried to rescue GeoCities and like reclaim them. It's beautiful. It was awesome. Oh, I, I will actually, I will look for that because I, yeah. I do love 99% Invisible and I do, I do remember, at least for me, GeoCity was one of maybe the early, I don't want to call it a design tool, but it was for me as a, as a younger human being, it was one of my, I guess, tools that I used to really understand how do you put together design and building a site. And so you talked about Dreamweaver. I feel like that was like Dreamweaver Photoshop was definitely like the gateway drug for a lot of earlier devs of our generation, maybe mm -hmm. for, you know, for some, but as you talk about this evolution, as you gain these skills throughout the years, like what, what has, 
what has your experience been like transitioning through various types of toolings as well? Yeah, there was a big uh, a moment where things kind of clicked for me where I was a user of GeoCities and like a fascinated kind of voyeur of GeoCities. But the first time somebody hired me to make a MySpace layout and customize a band MySpace layout, I was like, and again, necessity, right? They were like, hey, you're doing like graphics and stuff. Can you can you make our band MySpace? And I was like, of course I could do that, which is always a lie. I have no idea how to do that. Let's go for it. I could try. And that was the first real click for me where I was like, uh, oh, okay, what's a div? What this, things are weird. How am I bringing all this together? That was a big th moment where things clicked. And then when I moved past that and realized that I could build things from the ground up, that were not dependent on things that I had to force them into weird wedges and angles. I was like, I can build it my way to make it work. I can hand roll things and I don't have to deal with all of this legacy code with all of these constraints. That was another big click for me. So it was the click of you can make stuff. It, it, it can get out there to bam, I can make it my own doggone self and make it the way I want from the ground up. Those were big, big evolutionary moments in not, I wouldn't say my career in my understanding of what's available, of what I love to do, um, of discovery and the eureka moments and dopamine rushes and satisfaction. Those were big moments for me. And so with these big aha moments, when you when you are building and you're using these different types of tools, like when do you also realize that you needed to evolve from a certain tool or what, what kind of like, because I think tools change, but I think a lot of fundamentals stay the same, right? Yeah. A lot of the fundamentals stay the same. And so like what fundamentals stick with you regardless of the toolings that you use? Yeah. I would say first it's a fundamental philosophical principle, which is never fall in love with the tool or process, fall in love with the outcome. That's, that's for me is like, I don't want to become a fan boy over a certain operating system or tool. I want to be excited about products and releasing things and making things. And so therefore I could give a crap, like what you use to get something out into the world. Did you push through whatever barriers are there to get it out there? That's for me, that's the bigger thing is a mindset thing. Although I would say there's another mindset thing that has to do with tool specific, which is if you, somebody said this, uh, you know, to me a long time ago, much smarter than me, but the key to frustration is unmet expectation. So if you have an expectation that I'll just keep using this tool forever and then all of a sudden the boat has sailed and everyone's using things that are easier, faster, better, make more sense, technologically fit into the, the, the culture, the context and, and the use case. Well, now you've, you've become a fanboy of something and you're real frustrated. Why, why isn't, why isn't the browser accepting what I'm doing? Why isn't that happening over there? You become this frustrated person versus this moldable person that says, I have no expectations. I, well, the only expectation I have is taxes, death, and that tools will change. That's okay. Let's just, so let's keep pushing forward and not be so rigid about these tools, but be more rigid about what success and progress looks like. Progress is moving forward, whether you like it or not. Like, yeah, we all loved MySpace and then it died and then it just became a dead duck in the water and you could grumble like no oh, that sucks my space is gone or you could move on and go all right hey. on to phase two on to phase three on, on to facebook so on to facebook yeah yeah exactly and i think that i think that you know something that i i, I know you've shared before in the past is that to you a huge value that you believe in is consistency so it can be the consistency of the production of the work it, it's not about necessarily how you get there or what kind of toolings you get there but the fact that you're able to consistently just learn more tools grow more or even consistency of producing the products the designs the portfolio that you want to build yourself and and i think that that truly that truly um reminds me of if you if you look at how different types of toolings have evolved through the generations right through the generations of, of for both designers and developers I also see, and, 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 you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I almost feel like there's kind of a, a merge in, in the sense of like, sometimes I don't even know, is this tool for a designer or is this tool for a developer? Right. Okay. And so, so, yeah. so I think that, I think that with, with a lot of the rise of these types of toolings, it, it actually empowers more just 
people, whether you want to call them a designer or developer, et cetera, to be able to build, which is kind of to your point, like it's, it's not about the tool. It's just like, what, what do you want to build? What is it that you want to create? And so from, from your perspective, have you seen, um, you know, tools merge or, or is that really just, you know, something that I've, you know, kind of thought about? Um, no, uh, yeah. I, I mean, I think the, I think what we're seeing happening, especially highly accelerated in the last five, six years, let's say, but it's always been this way, but especially in the last five or six years is the removal of gatekeepers the removal of barriers, right? So no longer do you need to go through a publisher and get a deal. You can self-publish. No longer do you need to get a TV job or, or, or like land a contract for a sitcom. You can make TikTok videos. No longer do you need to have a syndicated radio show. You start a podcast. So gatekeepers are being removed left and right. And those old antiquated dinosaur gatekeepers are freaking out about it. That's why Toys R Us went under because they didn't realize we need to move to online quickly. That's why Blockbuster died because they didn't believe that everything would move to streaming. So gatekeepers are being removed and all of it is, all of us are becoming independent content creators and publishers and makers and, and producers of products. And part of that is the removal of the gatekeepers of what's a design tool and what's a development tool. Right. So it's um, there are plenty of tools out there that are built to work for both sides. Now, is there there's always going to be engineers. There's always going to be development teams. There's always going to be designers. But the breakdown of those, quote unquote, titles and those lanes and the tools that you use in those lanes are starting to merge so that maybe you're really strategic like um, engineer, like you know how to put something together, you know about information architecture. There are, I mean, again, not to go way back, but Bootstrap came to life and they're like, you don't know how to design? Just use this stinking framework, add this class, do this thing, button, bam, now your product's up and running. Why? Because we're removing gatekeepers and barriers to say, oh, but I don't have a designer. Oh, but I don't have a developer. So use a no code tool, use something that will merge the two together and be your own thing, right? You can whip together entire web applications right now using a no code tool and Zapier integrations and something else and plug and play everything and mad scientists this thing together. But that's what innovation looks like. Mad scientists like figuring out ways that don't fit the standard narrative. So I just, I've seen just this massive uptick in people and everybody has this in them, I think. Everybody has the ability to be a creator and ma a maker and a producer of something. It's the tooling that has slowed everybody down because of that onboarding and that learning curve can be so steep, right? You want to launch a digital product. You're like, I don't know any back-end languages. There's a way now, right? So I've just seen that happen in a massive way. And tools are starting to take note. The In the last... I swear on everything in the last two months, I've gotten more emails, product hunt, like release notifications yep. for no code tools, online builders, blah, blah, blah. Like it's just amplified into a, a level that's unbelievable because, and all of that stuff isn't happening overnight, right? People started shifting that way five, six years ago, and it's all starting to come to life. It's all starting to, to, to be released for people to start using. So we're just witnessing what people were already kind of experiencing and feeling in their hearts, like in the last five years. I think to dovetail your point, if you remember going back to meetups ages ago, like I'm talking 2013, 2011, I remember you would go to these meetups, these tech tech based meetups and everyone's like, oh, I'm or even at a hackathon, like, hey, I'm looking for a developer. I'm looking for a developer. I'm looking for a design. I'm looking for X, Y and Z. And and I used to help organize these meetups or I used to help organize these hackathons. And I would say, you know, for just this weekend or for this session, you don't need to build something like you don't need to build the end product. You just want to build the MVP. You just want to get the idea out there. And I think that back then, seven, eight, you know, X, 10 years ago, there just weren't these tools. So to your point, it wasn't overnight that these tools came. It was within the past, you know, the sensation, maybe five years that these tools really started to come out. And I think it's also piggybacking just the the access to creation the access to creation now anyone can create something and produce something and and that's the first step it doesn't mean it has to be a vc funded back backed startup it doesn't have to you know if you build it internally at your company it doesn't mean it has to take fruition but i think the most valuable component the most valuable component is just to be able to to see it 
in existence. And I think to your point, that is the first site of innovation is like, Hey, this is, this is just like scrap paper, but it, it's something. Right. Yeah. yeah. I think, yeah. Uh, yeah. And to dovetail on your dovetail, it, like this <laughs> idea of like back in the day, if you had this idea of like, Oh man, I wish there was something like that. Right. What you're actually communicating without knowing you're communicating it is I'm a founder and I just don't have the technical knowledge to build that thing. I have a great idea that I, I see a need for in the market and I'm the core user and I'm just too, I'm too afraid to learn that. I don't know that I can make that. And now my, like my wife said something to me the other day. She was like, I wish there was a dot, dot, dot. And I was like, you want to make it? She was like, well, I mean, I don't want to like start a business. I said, I'm not telling you to start a business. I was like, but I could help you make a mobile MVP version of this and you could launch it in test flight and send it to your friends and family. And it could just be a private application that we use. And she went, how do I do that? Because it's, <laughs> it's I, I would do that. Could I do that? Because it just, everyone realizes that they are more innovative and creative and, and a, able to be a founder of something because really what is a founder? It's a motivated person with an idea, right? So we don't go to hackathons anymore and say, I'm looking for somebody who has this role or somebody who has this role. What we should be saying is I'm coming to a hackathon or a meetup or something. I'm looking for people with ideas and drive, and then we will figure out the tooling. No problem. But I would rather have five people on a team that all have motivation, drive, and ideas and want and, and a desire and a grit to put those into play. We can learn the the tooling and use way like figure out ways to put things together versus I'm a developer. Okay, maybe. <laughs> maybe. But are you a creative problem solver? Are you somebody that says in your spirit, like in your bones, like, oh man, I gotta make this thing. I'd rather have those people. Those people are motivated to learn how to use something else and plug and play things together. Yeah. And I think what's so beautifully said is that like when you said, you know, you don't, you, you don't, I don't, you don't have to found, you don't have to be a founder where you have to go get this fundraising done. Right. You just want to build it. So, and that kind of reminds me, sometimes people just want to bake a cake. Like, doesn't mean you want to start a bakery. Just yeah, like, I just want to be a bake chef. A I just, just want to bake, a, bake cake. a cake. And sometimes building an MVP app is like baking a cake. Sometimes it takes a little bit longer and, and then you go into that flow state, but it's just, you just want to see it to fruition. And you're like, that was fun. Okay. All right. Yeah, that's great. It's done. It here. Put it on your portfolio. Um, but I think that when it comes to, when it comes to your point of, it's not just the skill set, but it's the mindset because that mindset will open up the doors for you to bring in whatever skill sets that you need. And I also see, I also see the shift in, in other developers, which is like, I think the, the stereotype is like, Oh, I'm just heads down and I just want to, you know, go into a flow state and catch bugs. And that's, that's fine. That's fair. I'm sure that there are people who enjoy that, but I also, I also feel like you probably, you being a YouTuber, you probably see this a lot more now. There are more developers as content creators than I've ever seen before. And it is like mind boggling. Right? right. And they're, yeah. And I think it's, it's absolutely mind boggling because you're no longer just that one identity. I think we are going through a renaissance where we have not multiple identities, but the renaissance man or the renaissance woman, right? right? Where, or renaissance person, right? Where you have, you're like, I am a full stack designer and I'm also a content creator and I'm also um, a, a hacker or a founder or a builder, or maybe you collect Pokemon cards on the weekend. I don't know. Um, that was, <laughs> that was a leading question. Um, <laughs> but, I, but I think that when it comes to, adopting new types of tooling and and i'd love to hear your perspective you talked a little bit about no code toolings do you find other designers are more willing to accept this do you find other and then how about on the other in the spectrum like technical folks do you find engineers are would they adopt them like i adopted canva canva which is like the drag and drop like sure. i don't know how to i don't know how to use photoshop but i can put stickers on an instagram box and yeah. now i'm a design you know air quotes sure. right but yeah there's i think there's uh in my mind like i see three groups of people right like whether you're a developer designer like whoever you are like you you might fit into one of these three groups right like at the very bottom you have the haters and the dinosaurs right and haters gonna hate and they're gonna be like 
they're going to hate. They're going to be like, I'm a developer. No code tools are stupid. You'll never be able to dot, dot, dot. And I go, really? Because about 10 years ago, you wouldn't have never even guessed that there'd be no code tools like there are now. So don't be a hater. I know you're being a little salty, right? Designers, Canva's not a design tool. Shut up. Yes, it is. It's a problem solving tool, right? So you're being salty and the day of the salty dog has to go away. So there's the salty crew, the haters. Then there's the people who are impartial, like, yeah, that works. Maybe that could work. Interesting. Okay. Like designers and developers are like, I, I don't, I don't see a need personally for me to try it, but I'm not against it. I, you do what you're going to do. And at the very top, you have this tier of people and, and they're designers, they're developers. I mean, I know, I know engineers who can build entire, like, like iPhone applications, like in a week, they're, they're so skilled. They're so amazing. They speak so many native languages. They are the Renaissance person in their industry or their area. And those people are still going, no code's awesome. I love that. I like, oh man, I built a no code like app the other day. Super fun. I know designers who like, I'm one of them, right? <laughs> like I'm a designer. I've used Canva for some stuff. <laughs> Like, so get up off my back. Yo. You know why? Cause like, I'm, I love building websites. I've been designing and coding websites for almost a decade. You know what rocks? Webflow. Because all of a sudden I can build a website in a single night and my hourly rate went to $900 an hour versus what I was trying to ask for before. You take a hike if you have a problem with it. Because what I want to do is make things, produce things, launch things and make users and people happy. Right. So uh, you can take a long walk off a short pier if you are part of the salty dog crew, because you're going to stay there and salty dogs turn into dinosaurs, in my opinion. So um, I just think that there's those three tiers of people and that that tier of people on the top, they've always been that tier of people on the top. It wasn't no code tools or whatever, but it, before it was people dragging people forward. Right. I listened to a great clip the other day. It was like from the 40s. And they were like talking about uh, like future, like the future, like technology, like restaurants and phones and all these things. And people were like, some people were like, that would never work. We'll never do that. I would hate that. And now everybody's using these technologies on a daily basis, right? So it's always the, the innovators, the visionaries that are dragging people forward and turning that second tier of people who are just okay with it into the next phase and then the haters slowly slide away and things kind of mix and match and i just see it like this so i it we need innovators that are are will humble themselves get rid of their pride and ego and not be fanboys of tools and processes and go the tool and the process could i, I don't care about that come with me follow me as we create something interesting that's what really matters that's what i see i i think that also something that it reminds me of is is as long as you have your values, your fundamentals, maybe even some architecture structure pat down, like the if you know the architecture of design or development, if you have those, it, it, to your point, it's not really about, it's not about what kind of toolings you use. Um, so I think like similar to what you said, like some of these tools that you mentioned, yeah, I, I do love those tools. It can be Canva, it can be Webflow. Um, so for me, one of the reasons why I build with these tools is being able to, to, I have this vision and I just want to be able to cross, cross that barrier to just to launch it faster. We have so many ideas, Jesse. I mean, like, can you imagine how much content and how much ideas we get on a daily basis? And yeah. if we're just able to create multiple tech, tech little cupcakes, it's just, it's great to see these creations come to life. And so I think when it comes to, I don't know if it's tooling or, or maybe it's more of the fundamentals, but I'd love to hear your perspective of how do you, either with designers or developers, how do you bypass or get, or get over this vision barrier? Mm -hmm. it, it, or, and, and I hope this isn't leading. I, I just say for myself, upon reflection, I feel like tools help me get over this vision barrier, but mm -hmm. I, I love to hear your perspective on that. I think tools can be really, really helpful to get you over a vision barrier. I agree, right? Because until you see what's capable, right? There is a cognitive blockage in our minds that can't even visualize or concept the thing that's actually deep in our hearts because we don't know what's possible, right? So as soon as like, I, I love using technology, tools, what I read online, what other people are doing as inspiration, right? Like in Austin Cleon's like favorite or famous book, like Steal Like an Artist, 
It's a little bit more visually driven, but he says, hey, there's no problem with looking at other people's work. Just look at what they're looking at also. You're going to find that person's inspiration. And now you start getting like five levels deep of inception and you're Leonardo DiCaprio pulling things into your mind. It's the same way with these borders and these these blockages is, oh, I didn't know I could make a web application. Well, now that you say it, now that I know it's possible, if I use Bubble or Glide or whatever the other app is out there on the market, now that I see somebody else do it, I could do that. This is why everybody now describes <laughs> their startup or their app as the Uber of, right? Because until we realize it was okay to get in cars with strangers, until... <laughs> Until somebody laid out that model that. and it was all yeah. app driven, all of a sudden it was like the Uber of dog walking, the Uber of restaurants, the Uber of we all describe it and define it as that for we did for a season. We got to right. get away from that. But right. it was like that opened our eyes, right? It opened our eyes to that's possible. Culture will accept this. We can technology will allow this. And that breaks down these mental blockages and all, what pops out is people's ability to vision cast and see things like I see something on the horizon now because this barrier has come down. Look, it's possible. And that's what I love. I love helping people see what's possible because there's so much talent, creativity, strategy, interest, like in the minds of human beings that the more that we release that, the better it is for everybody. All ships rise with the tide and the tide that's rising is the development of tools that break down walls, in my opinion. I think that with a lot of, so you, you described that like impeccably. I just want to take Thanks. a moment, just like a <laughs> round of applause. That is so well said. That was incredibly thoughtful. I, I feel very, very moved. So thank you for that. Like yeah. that I, you described breaking down that barrier so, so well. And I think that there is, I think there is, I think there is this struggle and I, I, I don't want to, you know, speak for everyone. So I'll just speak for myself. I think there is a struggle of either you become the best developer or the best X, Y, and Z. Cause you, you have the skill set. You can, you can pro, you can do X, Y. I, I don't think Mark Zuckerberg codes anymore, by the way. I don't think he does that anymore. He did once upon a time. And then there's, and then I think then there's this like, okay, I can code good enough and so what is it that I want to release? What is that right. vision that, and, it, and I think that's, I think that's fine. There's, cause there's, there's like the Michael Phelps, right? Like, sure. like he's one of the best swimmers. I, I can't really swim. So there's like the best swimmer. And then there is like, I can swim to not die. Right. Right. Yeah. And, and so it's just like, what is, what, like as a designer, as an engineer, like what is your path? Do you want to be, What's it quick? What's the famous designer besides you? <laughs> Tobias um, von Schneider, the designer of Spotify and the uh, and bunch of other stuff right now. Great, Tobias. Yeah. Um, so you can either go down that route, or it's like uh, I can use Canva. Right, and and I'm a big I'm a big proponent of um, getting away from imposter syndrome, which is just a big fancy word for, uh, self-esteem issues, right. Um, and lack of confidence. We've made a big fancy word for it now, but that's what it really is. Self-esteem issues. And, but what we all tell ourselves, and I got caught in this for a long time. And I try, when I mentor people, I try to get them out of this as fast as possible. I, I say to them, how many courses do you think you need to take before you're ready to start making something? And if the answer is always at least one more. I don't feel ready. I don't feel good enough. Shouldn't I also learn? And I go, no. Again, learn what you need when you need it. Start building as fast as you can. Apply for jobs before you think you're ready. Like we all have it in our mind that we need to be Michael Phelps to be a good swimmer. But that's really what it is really is a perspective shift, right? It's a different lens that you look through to say, if I view that as success, then I'm going to be training forever. But if I view keeping my head above water for five minutes, I've won today. I'm successful today, right? So it's a, it's a perspective shift that says, I don't need to go complete X amount of hours or this many boot camps or that many courses or this internship before I'm ready to bring my idea to life. Instead, I'm going to run with my idea and patch together a lot of stuff along the way and care to have two cares, uh, like about what anybody says along the way. People will always say something along the way. Like I had somebody just recently, a buddy of mine launched a new successful startup, uh, using bubble and like all of us, people were like, Oh my gosh, you did it. You launched your idea. So exciting. And people on Twitter were like, but it's made in bubble. And I'm like, yeah, you know what? 
take a hike, bro. Because this person <laughs> literally launched something and there's always going to be somebody out there externally to try to tear you down or internally to tell you it's not good enough yet and you need to keep quiet and, and keep moving before you make X, Y, and Z. And it's just wrong. It's a lie, right? And and that's what I'm excited about is I'm seeing, you know, I'm seeing stay-at-home moms and I have a kid like in my mentorship program, he's 11 years old and he designs amazing user interfaces and he knows he wants to be a mobile like UI designer and he's crushing the game, right? So it's just like all of this stuff is breaking down these barriers. I'm so passionate about it because I believe that everyone's built, I'm sorry to get too philosophical, I believe everyone's built to live a life of purpose and that purpose is more than just um, going to work nine to five, coming home and like watching Netflix, you're built for more than that. And there's this creative spirit that's been imbued in us, that's been put in us, that leads us closer to that purpose, that purposeful life, right? When you rise above like the external, internal kind of like keeping you down, I don't know if there's a word for that, like the keeping you downness, you rise above that and go, there's something more and I'm shooting for it. And I get to define what success looks like. The world doesn't get to define what success looks like to me. Sorry, long rant, but that's. No, I, I absolutely appreciated that because I think that when you're talking about these, I don't know if you want to call it visionaries, but these people who, who have a vision and they want to pursue that vision, maybe, yeah, maybe visionary isn't just for Elon Musk. Maybe right. visionary can be anyone who has a vision and will just pursue it and to your point, launch it. Yeah. It doesn't in the success of that launch doesn't necessarily mean how much impressions can they get. Mm -hmm. It's just the success is, Hey, it's out there in the world. And, and what would you like to do with it? Right? right. And I think also with a common theme that I see with a lot of people who are visionaries is I think to your point is that they will go acquire the skills and the tooling when they need it. That's when they're also most motivated. But I think there's also this huge piece where it seems like a lot of, and I think this was also your journey. For the most part, it's also self-taught. So a lot of the tools, a lot of the skill sets, yes, you can go to formal schooling. Absolutely. There's tons of really successful developers who, who also didn't go through a formal training. They just learned on the job. They learned through, you know, week, weeknight boot camps, whatever it is. So there is this self-taught component. And, and I think, I think like if, if I, if I take a look back, cause as, as you were talking about getting philosophical, I, I sometimes I ask myself, like we have through our creations, through our visions, we have created so many big things anywhere from the Amazons to the Googles to, to, um, you know, even, even like traditional traditional companies like like banks i think banks are often talked about like how do we redesign bank how do we reimagine um finance and i think that there is there is now this desire as there's so much competition for new ideas these these older companies or just companies in general it's like how do we also how do we also self teach and move towards this next generation of of productivity. And I, and I guess, you know, this was all, this is a very long winded way of saying like, you know, in your mind, um, I'd love to hear like, what are some companies that, what are some companies that you think nailed down design? And then kind of like a second part of the question, which is like, what do you think, what companies do you think nailed down their transformation? Mm. Those are kind of two different questions. Yeah. Nailed down their transformation. Sure. Yeah. Um, I think that uh, there's a couple of like really design focused companies. I would say like Adobe and Dribbble have done a good job of moving away from being a tool to a community and a platform where people can learn. So they, they've realized they need to launch education. They need to launch scholarships. They need to not just be a tool because tools get replaced, right? But communities don't. So they made this transition and I think it's, you know, as a design based, those as design based companies, they did a great job, right? Of saying it has to be more than this. They're, they're, we have to launch job markets and training and boards and places where people can find inspiration, find friends, like, you know, watch live content and, and grow as a person and, and feel kind of knitted and connected together with not only their craft and their industry, but people. So it's any company, in my opinion, that transitioned away from product to people is really, really smart, is doing doing a really good job in general. Because at the end of the day, not to repeat it, but all products are replaceable, 
right? But people just aren't. Relationships aren't. Like those are hard earned, hard won, hard fought for. So um, I, I see those as big ones. Um, I think uh, if I was going to think of a couple others, like any any tool that, and there's always like the the better mouse trap, the cheaper mouse trap thing. You know, I, I don't love that, but I think anybody who stayed the course and has been consistent, right? And who, who also stays true to what they are and who they are all the way through. We were talking about like consistency earlier. Consistency is a key thing to not deviate. You might tweak and change a little bit, like Dropbox might introduce paper and something else, but at the end of the day, they have to keep moving forward with what they do best and who they serve. So I see anybody that does that stays consistent, focuses on people, and kind of grows and listens to their audience, those are the companies that are, are going to absolutely crush it, right? Like Spotify like pulled like a massive purchase through the Joe Rogan podcast because they knew that people on their platform wanted content like the Joe Rogan podcast, right? They're going to push that way. They're going to use it as a spearhead to bring in all the other content, right? They're going to see Clubhouse doing something really interesting and launch Green Room or whatever they call it. So they're going to try to stay on trend, right? A little bit, but, at the, but has it deviated from their main purpose and goal, which is to serve people with their primary focus of music and audio hasn't right so i think it's knowing yourself knowing people knowing your audience staying the course anybody that does that's doing well yeah that was very very moving i i feel so motivated because i think you know as a developer advocate what i do as a developer is working with other developers building that community and i think to your point I and mean, you said it beautifully tools do change tools do evolve and tools do stay on course but at the end of the day how do we just as creators just creators no matter if you're a designer or a developer how do you build whatever it is that you want to build may it be solo may it be with a company may it be for your wife as an example and so i i really appreciate just you sharing that perspective and i and i am just such like i just want to give a shout one more time of like i absolutely love your content and i think that you do i think to your point like you dog fooding but basically you you understand that at the end of the day it's not about just the content it's about like or just the video itself it's what are the pain points of your community and how do you find those answers to give and, ba and mentor and give back to that community so I'll, I'll be sure to um drop a link to your uh to your channel uh because i think that there's just so much to learn um from your perspective regardless if you are a designer or a developer because at the end of the day it's just like what do we want to build how do we build together or how do we encourage each other to build yeah right yep absolutely i think yeah. you know like you were saying earlier and it's it's really like the biggest thing you can teach somebody is not a platform or a language or a design tool. It's resourcefulness and it's how not to grow weary as the journey goes on. Like if you stick those two things together, right? Be resourceful, figure out a way, like make a way when you don't see a way and stay the course when it gets hard. Those two things, in my opinion, are what we should be teaching people and encouraging people to because with those skill sets, they can go anywhere they want. They can learn anything they want. Teach somebody to learn, teach somebody to think and teach somebody to stay the course. Holy cow, will they innovate and make. And those are the type of people I want to surround myself with. <laughs> that is wonderfully said. And with that, sirens are on. And I so appreciate you joining us, Jesse. I, so much fun. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. This has been a blast. Hey everyone, welcome back. Again, my name is Sydney Lai and you have just stumbled upon Decoded, the podcast series for developers. If you want to learn more in the show notes, I'm going to link to our podcast series. Feel free to listen when you're on the road. And if you want to come back on YouTube, we have so many different types of videos on how to build demos. So feel free to join. And I so appreciate you guys hanging around. Please join us for our next episode. Again, this is Decoded. Thanks so much.